could just turn back to the portion we have read. And we have read in the first epistle general of Peter and chapter 2. We want to center our attention on words we find in verse 23 in their context. Speaking of Jesus, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Three strands of thought that we want to follow through here this morning. First of all, Christ's endurance of wrong. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. Secondly, his commitment of his cause into God's hand. Committed himself or committed his cause to him that judgeth righteously. And then thirdly, and I think we'll take maybe more time on the third part, applying application of these portions uh, to ourselves. And in that order, the endurance of um, Christ, the patient endurance of Christ, the commitment of his person and cause to the Lord, and the application of these truths. First then, his patient endurance. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. By reviling, we understand injurious words, accusations, false accusations that were made against him, that he was a seditious person, for example, that he sought to overthrow the Roman ruler. Also, the, the, these words, when they, when they charged him with, uh, with blasphemy, charging him, charging him with uh, being in league with, um, with Beelzebub, the prince of darkness, how sore that must have been uh, to the Holy One. And uh, blasphemy, as I said at the end, when they was taken for trial, and the high priest could say, what more do we need? This was evidence of blasphemy to them. The Son of God to be guilty of blasphemy. And we could take so many more examples of hard, grievous, accusing, derisive words that were used against him. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. He didn't return in kind. He didn't retaliate in the same spirit. And that when he suffered, when he suffered, he threatened not. The, 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 the first, the reviling speaks more of the words against him, the hard words. The, the suffering speaks of, well, the actual physical sufferings, the buffetings, the scourgings before, Pil before Pilate, for example. The spitting upon him by the Roman soldiers. His being crowned with thorns which spiked into his head. But above all, the whole scene of crucifixion. When he suffered, he did not retaliate in kind. There's certainly a portion in, uh, in John chapter 8 where he accuses the enemies of um, you are of your father the devil uh, but that is not uh, a returning in kind that is a, a true accusation that he's making that, uh, he, that is a, a, a reproof that is being made towards them for their devilish behaviour and look uh, as against that the, the, the response on the cross 
when the, the Roman soldiers in particular uh, dealt with them as they, as they did, mockingly. That wonderful prayer, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he was threatened, he threatened not. But he committed himself. There's the commitment. The commitment, his commitment is into thine hands I commit my spirit, into the Father's hands. As the true vindicator of his cause, the integrity of a soul, he could come to the Lord to justify him, to vindicate him as being totally innocent, as totally without sin in his response to them. And ultimately, it's into thine hands I commit my spirit. As we have been seeing, O thou Jehovah, God of hosts, that hast redeemed me. So that's the first part, the endurance and also the commitment of himself to the Lord. And now the application. First of all, by way of application, notice that some people might say, Ah, but it was easy for him. It was impossible for him to sin. And therefore, it must have been easy for him to respond the way he did. Well, let's look at this. Impossible for him to sin. Some people take a different view. They say it was possible for him not to sin. In other words, he could have sinned, but he was able to resist it. Others say it was impossible for him to sin because he just couldn't sin. It, the arguments used on both sides are as follows. Those who say that it was possible for him to sin, but that he resisted, say, how could he be tempted if it wasn't possible for him to sin? And among those who have that argument, there is Charles Hodge, one of the great uh, theologians of a previous century. But then there are those who say it was impossible for him to sin. And their argument is, he's a divine person. He is God. And how can God sin? And then they can point to... Uh, portions in scripture where it says they found no evil in him. Prince of darkness cometh, but he shall find nothing in me. Nothing in him. See, with us, there is something that the enemy can get at. There's indwelling sin. But Jesus could say he will find nothing in me. No indwelling sin in him. He's a divine person. Now that's the argument, that's the way that I want to go with you. Among those who take that, there's a man called Shed, another great theologian. So you've got good theologians on both sides. But the view it was taken today is that it was impossible for him to sin. And if that is so, then there's the argument of those who say it's easy for him to respond the way he did. But that was not so. The more he resisted, take for example when he was tried in the wilderness, when the devil tempted him, 40 days, and the command these stones made into bread and so on. Look at, look at the, the tension that was there for 40 days as he resisted. See, with us, with you and with me, when we are tempted of the devil, 
to our shame, so often we just crumble at almost at the first hurdle. So we don't come to we can't, don't we don't come to realize the tension that is in, in that is involved in resisting. But with Christ, it was impossible for him to sin. He resisted to the uttermost, and the more he resisted, the more he felt the pain, even the hunger pains in the wilderness. Here in the present, present, con, present context, the pain that was there is a holy pain. He has come, he has come unto his own, and his own received him not. He's come to make to make salvation available. That would be the joy of his heart. But it's being rejected, and all oh, there's sorrow there, and all oh, there's burden there for the Savior. Look at him over Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered you unto myself as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings? But ye would not. And Jesus is weeping. Weeping. And it's a loud wailing cry in that weeping. It was a felt sorrow. It was a felt tension. So that, yes, it was impossible for him to sin, but all he suffered, all he felt the tension of resistance, all he knew the sorrow that was in part and partial of it, and the grief. That is one application then. He did experience temptation and he did experience the grief and sorrow and pain of resistance. Another um, application is that we tend to think too often of just the cross as being all of that's engaged in atonement. But you must remember that from birth, from conception, right up unto the cross, and to the death of the cross. That is all part of his standing in the Roman place of his people to bring forth the righteousness of the righteousness of God required of him to require of them. These words of beautiful words of uh, William Cunningham that I love to quote. You can think of it as a as a, as, a, as, a, as the foothills reading up to the mountain, the cross being the mountain. And indeed, you, you, it's, it's not so much a, 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 a straight curve. It, it's certainly, it's, certainly it's, a, it's a progression that is there from a moment of conception onwards. But oh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a quantum leap when you come to Gethsemane and the cross. But nevertheless, there's that ongoingness from conception onwards. There's the active obedience that he must bring forth in the Roman place of his people, as well as that which was there in the cross. The active obedience that was there in the Roman place of his people. And the application that we have here is that the gracious response of these to these sufferings was part of the bearing the sins of his people. Every sharp word that we speak, and we do, don't we? None of us is guiltless. When as his believing people we come and plead his own merits, ah, these are, these are put away as well. 
they're part and partial. It's not just the cross, which is the, the, the main, the, by all means, the, 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 the zenith of these sufferings and is standing in our place, but they were there right through, dealing with these disobediences that would be in the lives of his people also. So that when they come and plead mercy in his name, Ah, these sharp words are put away. He is also our exemplar. You see that um, from verse 18 onwards, servants be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the fraud. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. And it says, For what glory is it if when we are buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, that is acceptable to God. When we are going in, when we, sometimes we get, we get buffeting when we serve it as it were. But um, sometimes we get buffeted when we don't deserve. We've been trying to sing some portions like that in Psalm 17, for example, where the psalmist could plead his own integrity against the false accusations made against him. When we bear these false accusations in the right spirit, that is following in the example of Christ. Christ is the exemplar of his people, and we are to seek grace to be walking in these footsteps as we go along. Notice also he committed his self and his case to God's justice. Committed himself unto him who judges righteously. Have you ever wondered that it's not committing himself to the God who loved him. Why was it the justice of God that he committed himself to, first and foremost here? Well, I think in this case we have to remember that the love of God is expressed, first of all, in his grace to his people. But it's also expressed in the way that he corrects error, the correction of error, the way that he vindicates his people, as we have been seeking to look at. So that the, when, he, when he commits himself to God as, to God and his justice to vindicate them, it's not bypassing the love of God. It's a, it's a byproduct of the love. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the, the, the love of God. It's from the love of God that the justice flows. The justice to vindicate his people to correct error. I think also you can look at this uh, is, is a, appealing to the righteousness of God in this case. I'd leave this with you, but you can meditate upon it. Christ was under a covenant of works. He's the second Adam. He was fulfilling the righteousness that was required of us in Adam not only before he fell, but after he fell. It was before the law that he must be, that, that, he, that he, he, it's the law that he must fulfill within the covenant of works. The law was required, the perfect obedience was required of Adam before he fell. 
and then the law demanded pen, pen, the, the law de demanded penalty of Adam and of his people after he fell. So it's the law that he must deal with within the covenant of works. And therefore, it's to the justice of God that he commits himself. Notice also the exactness of the righteousness of God. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Righteously. Exactly. Nothing will be missed in that judgment. That is a great comfort to the Lord's people. That he, as their substitute, has fulfilled all the demands to the least iota that the law requires of them as sinners. Perfect obedience was required of them in Adam. He has fulfilled in his life as well as in his death. The penalty that was required of them having fallen in Adam supremely in the cross. Nothing has been left undone in the Roman place of his people. They are justified with a holy justification. But to you, if there is any of you still in this state, out of Christ without this righteousness that Christ has fulfilled in the Roman place of his people well what can I say that law in his exactness the exactness of his demands the sword of God's justice is against you. And your sin is so great. The sin, we tend to, we, there's danger of us looking at sin as being a small thing, a matter of fact thing. But as the holiness of God against which we have sinned is an infinite height, so our sin is an infinite deep. There's an infinite aspect to that sin that is ours. And the law of God must exact its fullness of satisfaction against that sin in its infinitude. In its infinitude. And that means it will never end in its requirement. So if you're out of Christ, you're in an awful situation. Isn't it amazing that the hand of mercy is still extended towards you in Christ? Oh, everyone that thirsteth come ye to the waters and drink. Isn't it amazing that the mercy of God is still there in the one who has fulfilled all that demands of that holy law in your Roman place? Come, let us reason together, he says. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. Let us pray. What more couldst thou have done than thou hast done? 
giving thee an only begotten Son, the darling of thy bosom. To meet the requirements of thy holy justice. As he who knew no sin in himself was made to be sin for us, that we in him might be made the righteousness of God. How wonderful is the status of thy people with that righteousness imputed to them. How awesome is that state of the Christless. How amazing is it that still the cry of mercy is extended towards us in him and in him alone. All make him precious to us in his passion. The only mediator between thee and thy holiness and us in our depravity. And make him precious to us in his sufficiency. As the one who is God and who has therefore brought forth that infinitude of righteousness that is required of us. And all oh, make us thankful for the suitability of the one who is in our very nature, the nature in which we transgressed, who understands our frame, and who is saying, Come unto me all that labour, and I will give you rest. Receive us with the pardon of our sins in our speaking and hearing. For his name's sake, amen. Let us stand to hear the Lord's benediction. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit the Comforter, rest on and remain with you. Amen.